Now, now we're going to learn something new down here. Nobody's ever seen this before. Is it kind of exciting to dig up archaeological discoveries in your own backyard? Yeah, no kidding, huh? That, that, that is amazing. My, like I say, my best friend is an archaeologist. She's got to go to Central America and all over, and, and I go, no, I get on my four-wheeler and drive down along the edge of the lake here, you know? It's like my traveling museum, see? This is my, some of my artifacts. The most obvious one that jumped out was, you know, it's a hammer stone. It's nothing to do with Vikings or we don't know who it, but I, I, I have this habit, you know, like when I found this, you know, as soon as you find something, ah, oh, that ain't real. You know, you just, you just naturally, your mind goes to that, that's, ah, you know, it can't be, you know, like even here. That, that's a chapter by itself. It's a whetstone, but, uh, you know, for sharpening you know, your knives and your swords and, you know, you could figure every good Viking is going to have to have a whetstone, right? You know, you got a sword and you got an axe, you got to sharpen them. You know, I've been a contractor and a builder and, you know, it's a, building is about solving problems every day. It's like a big puzzle, putting the parts together for a house or a construction project and I'm trying to take that kind of way of looking at things and trying to, to study the, the rune stone and what is all this archaeology in Minnesota that just doesn't fit the Native Americans. It, 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 there's something out of whack here. And, you know, like even when I found that javelin tip, I went to the state archaeologist and, and he goes, well, it's either early settler or it's early, pine, you know, early pioneers, Native American. And I go, well, you know, maybe it's Viking. Oh, no, there ain't no such things. There were never Vikings in Minnesota. Leif Erikson is most notable for being the first European to set foot in North America, to Vinland. Uh, my name is Jess McCullough. Uh, of the four or five Viking bloggers that I'm aware of, I'm probably number five. Yeah. <laughs> the way that I've always looked at it is Leif Erikson strikes me as a very type A, firstborn son, overachieving kind of guy. Some of that could be because, you know, the sagas were written by his descendants and, and they wanted to make him look like a superman. You know, he went to Norway, he hung out with the king, he brought Christianity to Greenland. So, overachieving Leif Erikson is believed to have established the setup at Lonsa Meadows in the uh, uh, Newfoundland kind of area. The right picture here. A number of years ago, the Kensington Runestone International Supporters Club sent me this picture of this map, because I had all these ideas that Vinland is somehow related to Minnesota, see? And there, all those that say Vinland is maybe in Lansall Meadows or Lanias Meadows, however you pronounce it, or on the East Coast, there, it was like some taboo. We can't look in the Hudson Bay. What's up with that? So then I took and superimposed an image of that map on top of Minnesota to see how that would work. And what you come up with then is this strip of high ground in western Minnesota. We're on the edge of a long sandbar running this direction. And over here about six miles is Bear Knob, one of the highest points in the state. Just like we know Lake Agassiz was on that side of Minnesota at one time, over on this side was another sea. So then. Leif Erikson had come to this area of Minnesota in the year, and I think it was like in the year maybe 1003 is when he was supposedly had sailed to this place called Vinland. We went back and looked at, word for word, the sagas that were written of that period of time, 
And it clearly points to the fact that, you know, Leif Erikson did find a place called Vinland. And, you know, one of the sagas was real clear that on a, the return voyage in their afterboat, you know, the boat that they would tow behind, they had a cargo of grapes on board, wild grapes. Now, if you go out to the East Coast, they try to explain that away and they go, well, they didn't really mean Vinland like grapes, you know, it, that means pastures or, you know, it might have been, uh, you know, some other kind of berry. And I go, well, at least here in Minnesota, we got the wild grapes, you know, it's, it's the real deal, you know. And I've made the wine from it and had we time, I would have got a bottle out for you. But, and that's been kind of the bonus along the way is while I'm out looking for all this other stuff, I find these huge patches of wild grapes and then I mark them with my GPS and go back in the fall and harvest the grapes when they're there and make wine from them. It makes a very uh, robust type wine. It's kind of like, a, oh, what would you say, uh, like a blackberry brandy. You know, it's very warming as it goes down. You know, it's uh, almost therapeutic, you know, it just, just really unusual wine, but anyway, you know, this is where Leif Erikson came in the year 1000. But does it matter that if we find out that before Columbus, somebody was in Minnesota here? That's pretty significant. I, I think they might even change a history book or two. I, I would love it if Leif Erikson had discovered Minnesota. If he had sailed down the St. Lawrence and portaged through the Great Lakes and set up a trading post somewhere, you know, Duluth Superior, I think that would be marvelous. But I have yet to be convinced that that's the case. There's just, there's nothing for it, unfortunately. <laughs> I got a grant uh, from the state to do Viking reenactments, but we're also shooting a lot of behind the scenes footage okay. of the Viking reenactment. Um, okay. Well, you direct us. Sorry, the, um, ideally this pop should go all over this <laughs> Oh, <laughs> my bad. What are we doing wrong? What did we get wrong today? What? <laughs> well, um, yeah, well, I don't, I didn't want to be the guy that, that nitpicks at people having fun or making movies or, or whatever. I am glad that there are people out there getting into this kind of thing. For the, for, for the purposes of, of entertainment, certainly hit all of the highlights. Big weapons, horns, fur, you know, chains, gauntlets, that kind of thing. This is most people's perception of what Vikings look like. Sure. Don't, we, we nailed that, right? <laughs> Not, no, not really. Well, that very nice boat that you've got is clearly 20th century. The, uh, the horns on the helmets, the um, sword isn't right, and that helmet's not right, and all that kind of thing. Uh, I, think it was, I think it was Leaf's tunic looked all right, his, his sort of woolen uh, outfit there, but that was about it. That was the only thing we got right. Yeah, the spear point looked OK. That's pretty much all you got right. Does the Viking wear a sundial wrist with that one? Did you see it? Yes. Uh. I think that I don't take any issue with people uh, if they prefer to wear horns on their helmets. That's fine. You know, it's, there's. Uh, I, I don't mean to downplay the risk of of getting history wrong. There's certainly been cases where erroneous history has been used to justify all manner of atrocities. I mean, the only you don't have to look very far back. You know, it was it. I, I think it was just the other year uh, in North Korea. They announced that archaeologists had discovered the unicorn lair of North Korea's mythical founder. <laughs> uh, history is the myths we tell ourselves to help us make sense of our daily lives. We're sitting in my office at Arms and Armor. I'm Christopher Poor. Sword King. What did you say? <laughs> I just joke. You know, I won't have a commercial on Channel 29, though. Gotcha. Come on down, because at Sword King Sword Emporium, you get the best deals on the finest product for the most money. You know, no, we won't do any of that. It's just not who we are. We're, uh, we're a little lower key than that. That'll work. Yeah, so this is, this is where we do the fire and the hammering and the grinding and all that stuff happens in here and the owing. But, but didn't 
your parents or anyone who loved you tell you you can't grow up and make, <laughs> and make swords? Uh, well, I got a liberal arts education, and they tell you you can do anything, right? So, uh, <laughs> Is there such thing as historical accuracy? Um, historical accuracy. <laughs> We're always interpreting. We're always striving to create and get something that is going to work for us, but at the same time is an understanding and not an absolute. That's about as good a proof as you can get. You know, if you need more proof than that, then you better start working on time travel. I mean, you know, everything, everything we think we know is all based on what somebody somewhere wrote down or told a story about or lied on camera about, like in my business. You know, we all look at history because we're taking objects from the past and we're trying to bring them into the present. Well, we do our best and we do a pretty good job, but are we making something exactly the same way it would have been made 600 years ago? Well, probably not. Like I say, if we actually knew the truth of what really went on, it would either appall us or bore us. So we come up with a really great story that makes sense of everything. I suppose a lot like religion, but I don't think you'd like to tell that to people. Uh, I'm Tim Jorgensen, and I'm the event coordinator for the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County at the Yemcombs Center. Um, why do you dress up like a Viking sometimes? I dress up like a Viking quite frequently. Most of the time it's as a Viking reenactor uh, to educate school groups or to uh, take part in a living history encampment or other events. I know that you said most of the time. Yeah, sometimes you just have to try them on to see how your fit is and where you've got to make some adjustments. <laughs> that. No, my fiance does not ask me to dress up as a Viking. I've made her an outfit really? and she does in fact wear it for the Viking festival. Is it fun? Yeah, I think it's fun. Everybody that is really involved in it always has a really good time, so. Including you. Yeah. <laughs> This is a Danax. This one I bought used, but it was made in Minneapolis at a place called Arms and Armor. And uh, it was made for fast action and fighting. Good skull splitter. I searched for Viking axe on Craigslist and sent someone on their bicycle to go pick it up for me. He doesn't even get into the fighting aspect of Viking culture, so, I mean, he. He thinks he has health problems all the time when he doesn't, so actually giving him a sword to actually cause pain is not gonna happen. <laughs> He's very fun and cuddly. He's kind of the opposite of vicious and bloodthirsty. <laughs> He's very pacifist. I just find it really relaxing. Everybody wants to be what they're not. <laughs> Maybe it's just they're so far from it, they have to look back and remember what it used to be like. I don't know. celebrate the 2013 Brewstone Day. Coming down the street right now is the Hoffman Kensington Good Samaritan facilities in Hoffman and Glenwood and surrounding communities. Do you want to start? No. I'm Courtney Giese and I am the Donnelly Thrashing Bee Queen. We are in Kensington, Minnesota. Population 286. 
celebrating their runestone days. What is the runestone? I do not know what the runestone is. Is it a type of rock? Yep, type of rock. Do you, uh, uh, do you believe Vikings were here in the year 1362? Yes, the Vikings were here. They were? Yep. Why do you believe that? Um, well, the Vikings were here in what year? What year? 1362. 1362 because um, this maybe used to be a lake. Uh, I don't really know. <laughs> I'm not educated like that. My daughter is the Little Miss Donnelly. The Little Miss Donnelly. Uh, yep. They didn't seem to know a lot about the Kensington Runestone. What is this runestone? The Runestone is a great big rock that a farmer found in his field and it took them a while to figure out it was some sort of Viking cuneiform writing or the remains of possible Viking cuneiform writing. There have been several books written on it. Um, it's been hypothesized that it was a mooring rock for an ancient Viking ship. It's been hypothesized that it's a fake. It's been hypothesized a, a lot of different things, but there's been a lot of research going on about it. The runestone is a, okay, I'll just say a monumental rock that was found on a farm about three or four miles northeast of here on a farmer's farm. And I can't remember what his name was. Olaf Oli, Ullman. Olaf Ullman, thank you, Molly. And um, it was put there, they believe, by the Vikings or the Norsemen, who whatever, when who traveled years and years ago, whatever, to discover different parts of the country. Lloyd Flotton, and today we are in the Kensington Herd Society in Kensington. Okay, my name is Ruth Johnson. My father was born the same year, 1898, as the rune stone was found, and um, a true believer, always a true believer that it is authentic. You, you are. I am, and my father was, and my grandfather was. So. When the rune stone was found, my grandfather was one of the first persons to see it. This is my grandfather, Nils Flotten, and my grandmother was Tilda. After they had uprooted the tree, uh, Olaf Oman's son, young uh, Edward, was there, and uh, he brushed this uh, soil away from this rock, and here he noticed it was carvings on it apparently could figure out it was runic uh, writing. What does it say on the rune stone itself? Um, ten men, red with blood, found dead. Mm -hmm. And at the end, the meaning is Ava Maria, you know, that they um, may rest in peace. And you know. the, the story on the rune stone tells that they were eight goaters and 22 Norman on a journey of discovery. We, easiest to describe it is to look at it. The story on there says they, they were here, third line down says Vinland of West. And, and, and runestone I often say is kind of like a tombstone because it tells that there were 10 of their party were killed and they left this stone as kind of a, a memorial to them. In 1355, the King of Norway sent Paul Knudsen on an expedition to find the Greenland colony. I am a Viking. I am Paul Knudsen. Uh, this uh, Knudsen expedition was sent out there in search of remnants of that Greenland settlement. They had settled, uh, first of all, in Iceland, and then they went on to Greenland, and actually they had some pretty extensive settlements in Greenland, but then they maybe went further and landed here in North America. If they have a, have a settlement someplace and then all of a sudden it disappears, they have to find out why. Why, why were they, you know, it's not just about the runestone. No, the Vikings were here, Leif Erikson was here, and now Paul Knudsen is coming here looking for them in 1362. And 
so Paul Knudsen was given this commission in 1355. It's well documented by King Magnus Eriksson. And, you know, so supposedly him and, and maybe two or three ships, and if they left in, you know, 1360 or something anyway, they, they're the ones that we believe came here, left the rune stone. There's also documentation that there's probably six or eight of them of that party that made it back to Norway. There's no record of Paul Knudsen ever made it, but there were maybe one or two bishops and, and others that, you know, had made it all the way here. They were looking for, you know, what happened to these guys, so. What's it mean to history? I mean, what's it mean, what's it mean to America's history? That well, if, if it would, uh, the obvious thing, 1362, that's a little bit before 1492, and that kind of leaves old Colombo out of the picture, you know? Uh, and, you know, you know, it's gone on for a long time that this, you know, oh, let's see, uh, Michael Miklovich, uh, anthropologist up in Moorhead, he calls it the, the folklore of uh, folklore history of Western Minnesota or something like that, you know, how there are all these stories about Vikings, you know, how could this be, you know? When they left, when they left Sweden, they had no intention of carving that rune song, but like, this was their marker saying that we were here and this was their, their markers. So what do you think, what were they doing here? This was for acquisition. Like a land claim. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I say, this is my lineup. This is my property. I have been here. I'm laying claim to this territory. Okay, when we get out there, you, you've been out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's all the graves of the, the 10 graves where all the Scandinavians were buried. This is where they were actually, when they came back and they said, we found 10 men red with blood and dead. Mm -hmm. And this is where they found them. I'll show you a lot of this stuff out there. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll head out there. Okay, now what we'll do, we'll start out, just we'll start out like, like uh, first grade here and we'll start out from the beginning. This is where they put a monument up to saying this is where the stone was found. Okay, so what we do is take and rub the stick right here on the little marker. I'm looking for where that was found. So now we'll just, just walk up the hill here. Look at that, right here, just right here. This is right about where the stone was found, right about in here, right in this area. They didn't know exactly where it was, but this is why these things say this is where it was actually found. This is where it all started out, right about this spot right here. Yep. Right in this area. Well, you know, the, the, the old way of dowsing was they took a, a willow branch, you know, and they kind of bent it inside out, you know, and, you know, and, but the new ones, oh, I'm sorry, I used to even carry them around in here. You know, we use brazing rods now, you know, and then they're out there, you know, just basically, and they'll, the rods will cross, you know. I don't know why, but they do, you know. So do you consider it like science or magic or like how? This is something that's that hard to explain, you know, how do you, how, how do you explain it with the, it's well, just like going up here and say, I'm looking for water. You've heard all these guys going out and finding water and take the stick out there and go out and they find the water and then they punch a hole in there and the water comes up. But I'd like to find the fish cleaning tables because they should be down in here. So I'll just, I'll just kind of wander along and see if I can find the fish cleaning tables. Yeah, right in here, a, this is where it shows the fish cleaning tables were. And they were all codfish, all saltwater fish. Like originally, when you figured that out, did you just sort of have to go through? Species yeah, you just you fish? just ask it, just say, well, was it was it was it walleyes, was it northerns, nothing, nothing. Was it codfish? I just asked it, was it codfish? And it says yes, yes, it was codfish. Yeah. 
Were you surprised when you discovered that you had this ability to? Yes, yes, I was totally surprised. And my grandson has got the same, he picks up a stick and it works for him. So is it rare? No, well, we don't know. This is why so many people are afraid to try it. You know, and say, well, that's, that's a bunch of baloney and, uh, and they're afraid of it. And, and it seems like the more intelligent the person is, the less likely they are to believe in it. And yet, it shows us what we want to know out here. Okay, I'm looking for toilets. That was up a little bit higher. That's where we. Ah, uh -huh. here's where they are. Here's where this. Here's where it shows your toilets right above the fish cleaning tables. Okay, now when you got that turned off and you got this thing turned off, then we'll get into where the next interesting is. So you can have this one here. This one right here. Yes. Okay. Well, this this is a replica, and uh, uh, for the time being, at least, this is as close as we can come to having uh, the stone. Why isn't it in Kensington? I'd like to know that. I don't know why. We've been fighting for years to get it. Here. Yeah, they have. It's been a big scandal type oh, thing, as far as I know, to get it back scandal. here. It's just been a big well, ordeal. It's kind we of the same thing. It, not Alexandria. I don't know. Kind of a feud. I think they sold it to them years ago, didn't they? Something I don't know. Okay, this is the replica of the rune stone right on the shirt, and it says, "What does it say? I can't read upside down." At one point, a group of men from Alexandria actually purchased the rune stone. A group of businessmen did so-called buy it, and uh, there's a little controversy on that too. But anyway, it's, it's uh, I feel, in a safe place in Alexandria. But rightfully, it should be here. <laughs> the one over in Alec is... Uh, in a glass case. Uh, because it weighs something over 200 pounds. Oh, how much does that weigh? Oh, this is, I have no idea, very light. We're not allowed to touch it, right? Well, this you can touch. Uh, well, I think so. Yeah, it's light. It's made of, uh, made of plaster, I think. There's nothing, nothing sacred about that. <laughs> thick and they're all going to be big bundles of grapes this fall. Wow. wow. That's really cool. Isn't it? Wow. Look at all these grapes. I'm Steinar, the crazy Viking. I am the proprietor and uh, creator of the Nordic Inn in Crosby, Minnesota. It's the world's only medieval brewing bed. Unless the internet's lying and it's known to do that too. Yeah. I'll give you a little sound of it. <laughs> That's the same horn you hear in the Metrodome in Minnesota Vikings sent me that. So, I have five rooms with six beds. 150 bucks a person for two nights, two shows, four meals, and my bad jokes are free. This one lady said, go to hell. I said, I can't, I've already been to Green Bay. People go, don't you hate Packer fans? I go, why do I have to hate them? I can easily outsmart them. You know the difference between Lambeau Field and Porcupine? The prick's in the outside of a porcupine. Everything I do is taking things a little bit further than most people would be willing to take. The bound I went through to get this done, I was like, it was incredible, the resistance that I had to go through. Really? I went through five, four public hearings in five months until I tricked him into letting me do it. Well, I come into town a long-haired single parent with a brown-skinned child with California plates wanting to turn their church into a medieval brew and bed. It's not like they were waiting for me. Yeah, that's what we were thinking of doing. Yeah, right, yeah, no, no, no. Now, um... Everybody calls it the Viking room. It's actually the least Viking of all our rooms. This is the locker room. This is Astroturf from the Metrodome. 
Most women will not think this is very romantic, although ankles fit well behind here and the leverage is tremendous. I had a couple come out of here one morning, the guy goes, I tried to make a last minute score, but the goal line stance was too strong. <laughs> As sort of a professional practical joker, do you think that maybe we should admire Olaf Omen for just committing to a practical joke? That, well, uh, my God, saying? would anybody commit to a joke where they lost all their family? His wife dis uh, divorced him. His kids disowned him. He died a ba broke, penniless man. What did he get out of it? It, it ruined his life. He, he benefited nothing from it because he wouldn't say it was fake. I mean, it's hard to say it didn't come from Vikings. I, I want to find people who find me the reason why it didn't come from Vikings. Okay, so the, the thing I wanted to ask you. Yeah. What is the Kensington Green Star? It's, uh... <laughs> in short, I'd say it's a fake. <laughs> Ah, the Kensington Runestone and assorted other pieces from across the Mid-America. Um, I, I, can't, I, I can't believe it. I, I, I would love for it to be true, but I, I don't think that it is. There are a lot of believers, and it's understandable, I think, why people would want to believe in it. It's the same pride and heritage, and it's a great period to be fascinated with. But unfortunately, that part of Minnesota, we're not finding any metal from boats, any wood, any leather, any, anything that archaeologists would be finding in Scandinavia uh, today. I've, I have yet to see evidence that would lead me to believe that these are relics from the Nordic cultures. Uh, doesn't make much sense structurally as far as knowing the cultures and uh, you know the Vikings were explorers obviously they were out there but you know why would they trudge into the middle of Minnesota across forest and prairie to leave a stone um, well okay so I'll do the introduction so I'm Eric Dregney I'm the author of Vikings in the Attic and in Cod we trust and other books like that um, yeah Okay, one of the arguments against the stone, of course, is that Olaf Omen, who is the son, who is a Swedish immigrant here in northern Minnesota, um, so he finds the stone. And so people say, well, he found it. What's he trying to prove? You know, with Minnesota, it's if you put all the Scandinavians together, it's the largest group. And so, well, conveniently, we found the stone here. Why would a bunch of people from a small portion of Europe come halfway around the world and settle in an area and then suddenly find all the artifacts from the small area of Europe they came from. Um. In the 19th century, there was an awful lot of that. There's the anxiety of who discovered the United States. You know, what, what white person discovered this land that had 100 million people living in it already? They're coming from the old world here to this new land. They have no history here, right? But if they can prove that there is a history, then we could say, well, we were here, so we're essentially coming home. As far as the Kensington Runestone is concerned, I'm content to leave sleeping dogs lie. That's one of those great Americana things, though, one of those great quirky places in America that, uh, you know, it's like the world's biggest ball of twine. And uh, this is the town that thinks it was founded by Vikings. So, it's fine with me. <laughs> yeah, we've discussed the Kensington Runestone and whether the museum should have an official stance on it. We decided, no, the museum's not going to have an official stance. But coincidentally, uh, I don't think we have anyone on staff who believes in it. <laughs> we, we had someone in the gift shop, but um, that person's not with us anymore. <laughs> Fired? <laughs> no, yeah, no. She left her on her own well. So I'm welcome to discuss that, and our other staff are as well. Just as long as we say it's our own thought rather than on behalf of the museum. Uh, at this time, I want to introduce to you uh, the, um, the, what's listed on your program as the Viking Battle Demonstration. And we have four strong Vikings here. Four! Oh, and they're dangerous, so be careful. This weekend is the Midwest Viking Festival, and there's also a race and a church service. Okay, so my name's Nathan Beale. 
Um, I'm originally from Nottingham in England. I, I heard about this thing called medieval reenactment. And I, I, I went to an event at a castle and I saw lots of people prancing around wearing silly costumes and thought, I want to do that. How do I do this? Viking battle equipment includes a variety of weapons, including swords, axes, knives, arrows, spears. Do you get nervous uh, before the battle? Was required to use these weapons, especially no, you can't lose. You see, you either, either you win or you die, and then you go to Valhalla, so you can't lose the battle. <laughs> and now, let's welcome our Vikings. My specialty here, um, I will be talking in, in greater detail about military matters, military practices, the kinds of equipment they'd be using. So 90% of what we're actually doing when we train is training to fight safely. Penetration tests that have been done at the uh, Royal Arms College in Sandringham in England demonstrated it would require nothing more than the gentlest flick to push one of these through a pig's carcass. Pig's carcass is usually used in these sorts of tests as a reasonable simulation of the human body. So we're not looking to hurt each other, we're not even looking to bruise each other, but we are looking to come in with what we call lethal intent. So we're not just gonna go, the idea is we'd come in fast and then use our, our training and experience to actually pull the blow right before it lands. And normally we fight two hits. So the first strike at that point, we would, we would envisage ourselves wounded. So we'd still actively participate, but we would perhaps concentrate far more on our defense than our offense. And then on the second strike, that's then the point where you'd, you'd consider that a kill. Will there be some runestone arguments this weekend, or is everyone pretty much on the same page? I'd love to hear some runestone discussion this weekend. Uh, I, I drop into them when I know they're happening in the area. It's a great uh, point of discussion around here, especially the Viking community and this part of the states. What, what is the Kensington runestone? The Kensington runestone is either real or it's fake. I'm pretty sure I know it's fake, but... It's, it's pretty clear from the excavations at La San Sao Meadows that a group of Scandinavians, possibly setting off from Greenland or Iceland, made it as far as North America. I, I don't think any archaeologist would doubt that. To get from there to the central US is an awfully long way. There isn't a direct river route. It's heavy, thick brush. So to actually push inland, I genuinely can't see it. So you're saying it's not real? I'm saying it's not real. My name's Daria Rakowski, and I, uh, and I am a reenactor. The last discussion I had um, with a rune specialist, um, admittedly, we were into our second ball of wine, so add that as a caveat. Um, he feels that linguistically there are inconsistencies. Well, the runes are the Old Norse alphabet. Ru actually comes from the Sanskrit word ru, which is, um, means secret, whispered, mystery. So take the basket think about your issue or your question what you need to shed light on and ask it of the runes and then when you're ready you can pick one at random Wunyo. that's the joy rune and it is asking you to only follow your bliss and to only do the things that truly bring you joy. It's a packed little rune, isn't it? Yeah, well, they all are. Yeah. To the layperson, I think the Kensington runestone must be the most famous ruins. Right, it's one of those things, it's such a hot button, you know, people who believe it, believe it through their heart, and people who don't believe it are absolutely convinced that it's a hoax. And, um, and I just don't really care. <laughs> I mean, what does it have? You know, even if it was a hoax, what a brilliant thing to think that one of our ancestors kept this alive like that. H how is that less miraculous? You know? I, I love it. You know, whether it's real or not, you know, 
it created such a huge uproar and it just had a whole culture of people just banging their fists on their chest going, see, see, we made it here. We are actually in the right spot. Their Norwegians were here. <laughs> so I've been paying attention to this whole issue for quite a long time since I first investigated it as an archaeologist in Douglas County. The Kensington Runestone might have been completely forgotten if it weren't for the efforts of a guy named Yalmar Holland, who from Wisconsin came over, looked at the stone, and became its champion. One of his ideas, as he walked around the site and examined the area, was that the large boulders that have small holes chiseled in them, that the chiseled hole was meant to be where you would insert an iron rod and then you would tie your boat. He began that whole myth of the Morning Stones and it's just never fully been dismissed. Why I hear there's a hole in the stone on our land is that that's where they stuck the dynamite to blow up the rock and clear the field so you could farm it. Um, so that's, that's what I go with. <laughs> Each time something is disproven, there pops up a new explanation entirely. Well, those mooring stones, they could be a land claim marker, too. The theory is on land claim markers is that any time a subject of the king of Norway was anywhere outside of his kingdom, if you carved a rune stone, that's a land claim marker. If you piled up three rocks, that's a land claim marker. If you put a hole in a stone, that's a land claim marker. So anything that you can prove that was of that Viking age is then considered a land claim marker. That's just the way the, the laws worked at that time with the, the Norwegians anyway, see? They're clearly not land claims. And the other issue is where can you cite a land claim even in the old world that looks like that? And yet people in Minnesota still cling to this belief that there were Scandinavian explorers from the 14th century in Western Minnesota. Uh, in, in spite of all evidence to the contrary and in spite of no real evidence to support that perspective. Uh, you're never gonna, you're never gonna convince everybody. Uh, uh, people are always skeptical. Uh, you'll always have skeptics, no matter what. You can, you can have hard evidence, hard, uh, good truths, and a lot of things, and yet people aren't gonna believe. Uh, it's no different than Christianity. Uh, a lot of people don't believe it. Uh, God gave the human race uh, a free will. You can do what you want, and, and this is the way it is. Grand County Museum. Uh, we have a fake rune stone. <laughs> My name is Patty Benson, and I'm the director of the Grand County Historical Society in Elbow Lake, Minnesota. Um, I have files on rune stones here because because our proximity to uh, Kensington, plus we have information on uh, what we call the Setterland rune stone, which was done as a prank. Uh, Victor Setterland was a guy that did not believe in the authenticity of the Kensington rune stone. You know, he was kind of a good, he was a prankster. Uh, he was good at carving. Uh, they said he wasn't such a good farmer because he lost the, he lost the farm, uh, but refused to move off. <laughs> um, back in, I think it was 1944, he found this kind of heart-shaped rock while he was digging out a path near Barrett Lake. And over the next few years, he did some carving, and he just wanted to prove that you didn't have to be an educated person to fake something like that. OK, yeah, here's the Sutherland runestone. Um, the experts started coming in. Professor Holvik from Concordia 
came and looked at it, and he kind of right off the bat kind of doubted the authenticity of it. Uh, and then you had this Professor Holland, who was a real backer of the Kensington Rune Stone, came and looked at it, and he thought it was real. And he interpreted the date on there as 1362 or something, which would have been very close to the Kensington Rune Stone date, whereas the professor, professor Hal Halvik interpreted the date as 1776. So quite a bit of difference there. <laughs> This battle started back and forth, and a guy named, uh, well, was it Helvick? You know, be, oh, Holvick. Holvick, you know, got in this battle with him, and it became personal. You know, it wasn't about the runestone anymore. He wanted to destroy Holland. He wanted to destroy the runestone. He wanted to destroy Holland. You know, he claimed, hey, I'm de defending the integrity of all Norwegians. You know, the biggest crock of shit you ever heard, you know? <laughs> well, Professor Holvick from Concordia, finally asked him if he carved the stone. And Victor said, yes, he did. And so, of course, then the pr professor asked, well, why didn't you say something before? And his answer was supposedly, because nobody ever asked. He, yeah, I think he fooled a lot of people <laughs> and didn't mind doing it. <laughs> Do you ever wish it was real? Oh, I think it'd be kind of neat if it was a real rune stone. I don't, being of Norwegian heritage myself, it's always kind of, Nice to think that, you know, the Vikings were here first before Columbus and uh, and I think, you know, if it were a real rune stone, it would give more credence, you know, to the Kensington rune stone and which, you know, it's still up in the air, although there, it seems to be finding it all the time that it's, you know, more and more, the more information they find out about that, the more it, it looks like that could be authentic too. Um, Why can't you just learn to love runestones? Well, I love runestones, and uh, there, there, there are, of course, plenty of real runestones to look at. Sweden's got a lot of original runestones and designs, and stories would be etched in sort of a various stylized ways, curving around the stone and winding up in the middle, for example, or being entangled with a, a beast or dragon and, and tendrils. We would like to have one out of here on the grounds. There's a Celtic cross reproduction that, uh, of one that the monks left on the coast of Norway. And I just met with the, the stone carvers yesterday. There's a company in town that's willing to make a rune stone for us if we can find a big stone that is suitable. You've got the rune stone. Yeah. Quickly. I bet I could drop it, it would stick straight up and down on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> Watch out. No, it stick up right. <laughs> do, you, do you worry that if you had a rune stone here, 150 years, 500 years, they would discover that and you'd be screwing up all of world history? Do you worry about that? About? Do I worry about? Putting a fake rune stone putting a, here. And, and having someone in the future find it and thinking it's real. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if we're holding the Viking festival out here on these grounds already, and we have blacksmiths reproducing actual artifacts with period materials and the right dimensions. It's plausible that someone could dig it up sometime and say they were here. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think every reenactor has a plan to get buried somewhere in some field with all their gear and hope to get found a thousand years in the future by an anthropologist going, what the heck? The rune stones that are across America are obviously, some of them are real bad fakes. Some of them might be better. Some of them might be done in a way that the, you know, the person didn't necessarily mean to fake, but it was taken that way, and they never said it wasn't. Um, but you know, we get questions a lot you know, where we get people that are, here's a spearhead. Well, it's, no, it's a 19th century finial from a fence post. Uh, you know, doesn't, can't you tell it looks like the French fleur de lis? And it's like, no, it's a Viking spear. And it's like, no, it isn't. If you want to have any sort of study of the past taken seriously, you have to follow certain guidelines. Um, peer review, um, acknowledging the other side of the argument, looking at a variety of sources. Because, yeah, that's, that's true, and people have been doing that forever, is that you can find whatever you want to find when you're looking back.
What am I looking at here? Doesn't look like much, just a hole in the hillside, right? And uh, so this will be one of my first digs. I don't know if we'll dig it this, this fall or it might be next year. I've only dug one test hole out here ever, but I dug a hole down, two feet down, you go, you hit a layer of burned out. It looks like, oh, cedar. Here again, I don't know if it's Viking, I don't know what it is. You know, we're gonna set up a camera and we're gonna take this apart archeology span style and see what's underneath there and how far it goes back. And, and well, this isn't the only one. You know, last summer uh, there was a story on uh, boats that they had found in Lake Minnetonka. The state underwater archaeologist had found it, so I called her up and, you know, we had a nice conversation for 15 minutes and she asked me what I'm going looking for and I go, I'm looking for a Viking ship. Oh, there's no such thing as Viking ship. We don't want you out there doing, looking for anything. You're not an archaeologist. You don't have a right to do this. There's no such thing. Don't call and talk to me ever again about this. I do not want to have to be associated with this. I do not want to lose my funding. I do not want to lose my credibility. Oh, that spoke volumes, see. When I originally learned all this, I wasn't really involved with the Kensington Runestone even yet. You know, it was just a story and I wanted to document it. We don't get into the discussion about the Runestone and the argument about that because there's been so many have did that already and at the same time, we're not the experts anyway. There's, there's linguists, there's runologists, and you know we'll, we'll let them do that. You know, so pretty much what we've been doing is just c compiling the data on everything else that could be related to this. You know, we're not making a claim that any particular one artifact is supporting the rune stone, but yet here we have around Minnesota 250, 300 mooring stones, and we have you know dozens of artifacts that have these same kind of stories about them. Why do you think in Minnesota we like digging up Viking things in our backyard so much? It seems like we find a lot. Well, I think it's just because, you know, the whole Viking thing is kind of maybe a, a little bit of romantic, uh, wishful thinking uh, to a point. What do you think we would have to find to, like, settle the question once and for all? Oh, gosh. <laughs> like, if we found, like, I don't know, like, you know. You know, if they dug down and found like Viking boat, something that was definitely a Viking boat or something like that, maybe that they could date, carbon date back to the, the 1300s or, uh, you know, something like that. Um, you know, maybe, you know, Vikings swords or something like that. You know, if they could date something for sure back to the 1300s, it would maybe uh, put the story to rest. <laughs> Would you mind okay. showing us the sword? Sure it's will. Follow you over we'll there. Over here. To start with. And we'll just go. This is a uh, replica of it. Yeah. When they decided that it was too valuable to have the actual sword in there, they made a replica so that they could show what it looked like mm -hmm. back then. So that's the replica right there. Yeah. This gentleman here, Hans Hansen was his name, and as you can see from this picture here that is on the wall in our mural here, he was plowing in his field and he turned over his sword here and that uh, he believed that it had come from Norway because the design that's on that sword, that same design was carved in a uh, church door in Norway and it went back to the year 1250. So the theory around here um, they believed that it was connected to the Kensington Runestone and that Vikings were able by seaway to travel and that they got down to the um, an area of the, the Kensington Runestones and the, somebody on that ship had this sword 
it was taken away and as they moved it was broken off and dropped in that field and then otherwise we were not certain how it could have got here but anyway uh, here's a picture of the great grandson of uh, Hans Hansen holding the sword and, and it looks a lot better and so that's the real sword he's holding that he's holding yeah it's his mother who keeps the sword I'm not even sure where they keep it you know Undisclosed. Yeah, so. Yeah. Okay, so, well, I better get this out. Of course, I have a hat, too. Oh. Now I really screw up my hair and just put. How does that look? My name is Beverly Hildy. I was married to Omar Hildy from Yulin, Minnesota. And his grandfather found this old sword. My husband passed away in 1980. So my three kids are owners of this sword. And once a year, we take it to the museum in Yulin, and they have a turkey barbecue in August. So everybody can just stop in there uh, and, and see the sword. And for years, I've been explaining to everybody that this came with the Vikings when they, when, they, when they originally came here. But my two sons took it to Minneapolis and they talked to a sword expert and he looked at it and said, it's not quite as old as you thought it was. Um, you know, recently I, I was consulted on the Yulin sword up in Minnesota, and it's a dress or theatrical sword from the mid-1800s. But the people at the time decided it was a Viking sword. It doesn't look like any kind of Viking swords, and the, at the time they had an expert at the university in history who um, was trying to prove that the Kensington runestone was real, so any artifact that came up, he would qualify as, oh yes, that's definitely Viking, and, you know, but it wasn't. You know, it's not, it, I'm not trying to, to be negative in any way about it, but you know, when you, you want to tell the truth, when you see something and you know what it is, you got to say, so. To me, it doesn't really make any difference. I mean, it might be worth some bucks, and then again, it might not be, uh, um, I personally, I could care less. It's just one of those things, you know. What are you going to do about the name of the museum? Fortunately, for yeah, we're going to have to probably we're going to end up we're going to change the name of this. We're going to have to take the sword out of there or the Viking part of it anyway. When we uh, we raised money to get this going, some of the people who were liked the word the, the Viking part of it. And, it turned out to be an inappropriate thing that we did to, to use that, refer, you know, refer to as that, but uh, now anyway, so um, we'll have to make some switches there, but. Are you allowed to touch it? Well, I don't know if that's even, I suppose it opens in the back. Oh, wait, there is a thing here. Here we go. You can feel this too, it's, it's heavy. As you find out things, you gotta kinda roll with the punches, you know? We're not here to uh, deceive anybody, because even if it was a ceremonial sword, it was dug up over 100 years ago and it has meaning to this community, you know? There's people who have stopped and they come in and they, th they think that they're just gonna see a, a sword and that type of thing where basically it's uh, kind of a micro history of the area. And uh, it turned out it's a pretty special place for us, you know. Actually, that's the first time I opened that. <laughs> Never taken it out for anybody before. Our 90 year old lady, when she sees it, she's like, oh. she'll have. I don't want to get you in trouble. No, I won't be in any trouble. That's okay. okay, all right. You can't get me in trouble. <laughs> Is there uh, a difference for you between what you believe and what you want to believe? 
Well, there always is, yeah. But I guess I, I changed my mind. I wanted to believe that this was the real thing. And I had a brother-in-law who didn't, you know? So we, uh, we find out that uh, some things what we perceive aren't actually real. What do you think about the Kensington runestone? Have you thought about that a lot? Do you think that might be real still? I sure do. I would go along with that, although there are a lot of doubters of that too, you know? So, I guess I'm gullible and more than somewhere you want to believe it's just like this, you know? Well, I think we need to know why people want, I mean, we, why people want it to be true and why people, and what if it's not? And what, what's their horse in this game here, in this race? Do you ever think of yourself as a Viking? Well, you know, sure, you know. A Viking fan, yeah. I watch the football team too. <laughs> but, you know, actually my name in Scandinavia would have been Eriksson, so maybe I'm, a, a direct link even, you know, but no. Here again, uh, yes, I am Scandinavian, so maybe I'm biased in that sense, but, you know, I don't, I hope they don't hold that against me. My personal beef with pseudoscience and junk archeology span and, and things like that is that, to me, the, the real past is every bit as exciting as anything that, that you could make up. There'll be doubters. There always will be. There's some people who still think the earth is flat. Well, the people that know the situation as well as I do have strong feelings about it. And when somebody comes up and says it's a hoax, it hurts. I have our family has never, ever had any doubts. Uh, and this is the way it is. So. Why does it matter if the, if the snow is real or not real? Um, it depends what you're using it for. If you're, if you're talking about how Swedes in the 19th century felt about their heritage, it's really cool. If you're talking about it as, um, a justification for a certain cultural group having primacy over another or being there first, um, there's a bit more of a problem with that. And I think that that is something that authenticity, for as much of a loaded word as it is, that does actually help us draw lines. You know, this, this is where it has to, to stop. Obviously, the, the general idea of beliefs when you get into religion and things is something we kind of need to tolerate in order to get along as society. And so I do that. I tolerate the Kensington Runestone believers all the time. <laughs> uh, my role as an educator and museum employee and just a Viking enthusiast is that when people ask about it, I share my honest opinion. And the believers are going to do the same, the same thing. Uh, Sure, the believers will raise their kids maybe with the same story, and we can just cross our fingers and hope that the kids will look into it a little deeper as with other beliefs. I'm ready. Um, who are you? <laughs> I am Lois Schultz. I'm your mother. <laughs> oh, we are in Kensington, my hometown. I moved to Kensington when I was five years old. I graduated from Kensington High School, 1963. And um, we come back every once in a while. I don't remember a lot about the runestone when I was growing up, you know. We never saw it, you know. We never thought much about it, except that we knew it had been discovered a few miles from where we lived, you know. And I just don't doubt it.
maybe because I was raised here. So when Michael and I told you we were going to do this documentary, what, what was your first thought? Well, I just think you have maybe an ulterior motive for all this. What? I don't know what it is. Because you're such a skeptic about the authenticity of the roomstone. <laughs> because you, you, you've said as much. <laughs> is it important we get history right and know what really happened? For me personally, I could care less. <laughs> Why? I mean, I just think that, you know, that's what happened. And so <laughs> I don't really need any verification about if it was authentic or not. What do you think it would take to convince people like me that there were Vikings here in 1362? Well, <sighs> weed. <laughs> I know you have. Do some research. No, I, you have to believe Michael. Why? If you believe, then you can believe the, the history that you hear. If you don't believe, you doubt everything, then you're always living in controversy. There is, in a way, this sort of inescapable personal aspect that you bring to any study of the past. Any scholar will tell you that everyone comes to the table with a bias. You know, everybody has their own interpretation. And one of the things that's kind of hard to accept sometimes is that you have to acknowledge you're never going to really, really know. Uh, when I look at it, like when I, when I ask myself why I study history and why I study the past and why I'm an archaeologist, for me there's always something very, it's almost, almost spiritual. Uh, and I'm sorry if that sounds over the top, but let me put it this way. We can't look forward. We don't know what's going to happen to us. We can only look back. And there's something about that looking back that comforts me. Because I know that someday, people are gonna be looking back at us. And that is the only kind of immortality that we can guarantee, is that we're, we're still thinking about these people a thousand years later.